when we seek him, but how much he penetrates our hearts, our atmosphere, our emotion is dependent on what we will allow in. And the words to every one of the songs, as the Holy Spirit chose, because that's how the worship team does it. They go before the Lord and ask what songs to have done. That was what the Lord wanted for his worship today. And um, when you allow your, your spirit, when you allow your mind, and, and you, you intentionally focus on him, his presence invades this place that just rocks you to your core. And um, it's, uh, it doesn't come when you're multitasking. It comes when you're focused on worship. And so I hope every single time you, you prepare your heart, even before you get here for worship. Don't let worship get you in the groove so you can hear the message. Rise to give him praise and then come and the worship together corporately is very beautiful. We're going to begin the service a little differently today and um, so I'm going to have John come. Please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord out of Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclose the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth." 
and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Father, bless this word that you have released to us this morning and fill me, Holy Spirit, that I might just share what you have put on my heart. Thank you, God, for the power of the word that you that is you. We know in the beginning was the word. The word of God was with God and was God. So I thank you for what you are breathing on this morning and just drive it home in our hearts. We just give you the praise and the honor and the worship that you deserve this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It was very interesting that the Lord has had me in a couple of different places this week and, or the last couple of weeks actually, and it was not Isaiah, which was interesting. It was the Gospels. Um, he often has me just in the place of Jesus' ministry. But then last week, um, he had taken me to Hosea, which was, because I was, I was kind of in a, a little series about, for the women, um, about the ways of God, and there's nothing that will challenge your thinking in how God works and his ways than the story of Hosea. It is just quite a story, and um, uh, one of the depictions of that kind of a story is in that movie that Brooke reminded us of uh, called Redeeming Love, which is a heavy, heavy story to, to watch in a movie, but it, it depicts the, the Lord... He just pursues us even when we are not faithful. He, he chooses us out of our sin and our depravity and our brokenness and loves us with an everlasting love and then begins to just work his transforming work within us. Man, don't ever lose your awe of who God is. That is, that is the most important thing in the times in which we live. And it's very interesting, Greg gave a little bit of a, a background, of which, by the way, he landed in Jordan um, uh, about 8.45 this morning. Uh, there's a seven-hour difference there, so praise God, he, he's there. And um, there are uh, great and mighty things going on, and I can tell you that. I know that for an assurance, but I'm not holding back anything that, uh, that I know that you don't know because I don't know. <laughs> the Lord knows what all this is about, um, this particular journey that he's on, but the, the Lord's already showing. He and Bill, who he's with, and Nancy, his wife, um, it's gonna, there are going to be some, some great things to tell, and the train is moving quickly. But he already gave last week some things about Isaiah. And, and what's interesting about the book of Isaiah is it's right at this chapter that the shift happens. You go from Isaiah, uh, the beginning, it, it actually, it's divided into different sections. But pretty much from, the, from chapter 1 to 39, you have this tone of heavy, heavy judgment. Just, I mean, judgment, destruction, you know, 
you're just, this is what's going to happen, and, and it's not going to be good because you're all wicked sinners. I mean, it's, it's, it's hardcore, rough stuff. But then you have this shift, and the Lord loves his people, but his holiness will not allow for enabling sin. And, and his love, you know, when you love someone, you don't want to see them stay in their pit. You know, Jesus meets us right where we are, but he doesn't spend time with us in our pit. He extends his hand to draw us out. <clears throat> I love that. And that is what really um, this chapter kind of begins because the first couple of words are the words comfort. But I want to just give you the key verse, the key verse of, of today and the name and title of the sermon, if you will, is um, just, I just want to give you some insights from this chapter is really all I just want to share with you this morning. But if I could call this anything, it would be lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes. Now, there are other um, scriptures that actually have the words lift up your eyes. We find in Isaiah um, <clears throat> 51, verse 6, in, uh, in the NIV, it actually says, lift up your eyes to the heavens, look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. We also see... In Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I lift up my eyes to the hills. This is in the ESV. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. In John 4, uh, verse 35, Jesus was saying, Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. In Luke 121, he says, when these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. I find it interesting that particular verse about lifting up your eyes also goes with the word stand up. And that was the word the Holy Spirit gave Wendy for Tuesday night service, which is stand, stand, stand. These are very, very interesting, very perilous times. We know that we're in a woe. We're in a foreshadowing. We're in a time that isn't, um, isn't leading directly. This is not the time of the days leading into the tribulation. This is the time leading into the rise of God's people, the remnant of God's people, for, to rule and reign on this earth with Jesus as their, the 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 power source through them. Jesus is going to rule and reign through his people in what is called the readying of the bride. And um, the thing that's weird is that, you know, there are things when you, if you've grown up in church, you, you learn from Bible studies, things that I always knew in the word but didn't know without Holy Spirit unlocking it. Like you can know words, you can memorize scripture verses and chapters even. And yet all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will just illuminate a truth, a wisdom and a revelation on you that you're just like, wow, I, I, I'm still in awe of the most, I think one of the first verses perhaps that I learned outside of Ephesians 6.1, um, which I think I copied as a heritage in my family. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Um, after that, I remember I recited this verse when I was baptized, which is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? This is King James is what I memorized growing up. That whosoever believeth in him should not, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you learn that as a child, you know that you know that you know that. But then you're spending time with the Lord and in his word. And all of a sudden, you realize that verse has layers and layers and layers of depth and power and wisdom and revelation. And you could just be laid out for a while with John 3.16. It is just like, don't let any familiarity of verses ever lose their wonder. And it isn't just because it's great literature or it's wonderful, you know, historic accounts or, or anything like that. It's, it's God breathed 
And it's everything that he says in his rhema word will agree with the Logos word. It will always be, um, his word is established. He speaks through his word, but he speaks in real time. Because as Greg said last week so well, you absolutely cannot know and receive I don't even want to use the word understand, but I would say understand through your spirit, the word of God without the Holy Spirit. It just, it, it is not a book. It is a book that people love to intellectualize. There, is, there are Bible scholars that, that have devoted their whole lives to the study of this book who themselves deny who God is in their own personal life. And that is astounding to me. But it shows you how powerful this book is, even to the world. Um, And then there are people who devote their entire lives to coming against this word and fight against it. And I find um, atheism both sad but kind of hilarious because people spend a lot of time fighting a God they don't even believe is, is there and real. And if you don't believe it's real, then you just don't believe and you move on with your life. But yet there's such a powerful force of them trying to discount, discredit something that deep down they know is real. They just don't want to believe it, so they're going to call it atheism or agnosticism or whatever um, that camp they put themselves in. But Isaiah 40 just has been a place that the Lord has had me park in And, you know, just for a little bit of context, what's interesting are these verses that the first one that it says, comfort, comfort uh, my people, says the Lord. The wild thing about what's happening here in this time is Judah still had God's people and the Judah portion of of God's people at that time still had a hundred more years uh, before their... um, before Jerusalem would fall, and then 70 more years, uh, 70 years of exile. So this statement here, and let's just look at this first verse because it's really amazing. Comfort, comfort ye my people, says the Lord your God, or says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. This part just blew my mind. That her warfare is ended. Her warfare is ended. There is something amazing about that statement. In the human realm, their warfare was far from ended. But it's kind of like what the Lord wants. And this is because I was saying, Lord, what do you want to say through through what's in this this chapter, which it's long and it's it's big, and and I'll make whatever insights I can within the time frame that, that he has me. But he wanted to say, you know, when I speak victory... The victory is there. When I speak it, my words create. I, the Lord God says, call for things that are not as though they were. So what we in Christ call for things that are not as though they were, being in Christ Jesus. And it's not unlike Romans 8, which if you ever just want to pick me up in a battle that you're in where you need some some a little charge, go through the the latter part of Romans 8, all of the promises about what a victor we are, what a conqueror we are, how the God works every single thing for good. Nothing is wasted, that nothing can separate us from his love. All these amazing things. Whatever the Lord says that's established out of his mouth is true. His promises are yes and amen. And I love that um, we can apply this today to right now. These are um, pretty crazy times. And I, I said, Lord, do you want the comfort, encouragement given now? Because, well, I, I basically just framed it as a question, open-ended. And he began to show me this paradigm of seeing that we are already victors is going to be more important now than ever before. See, we talked about this a little bit in the gifts meeting recently, but when you are living only among the weeds of life, if you will, the, 
the things to do, the reactions to all the things that are going on, the, the inflation, the rising gas prices, the schools being uh, an infected by the critical race theory, the, the constant um, uh, atmosphere of tension and feeling of people kind of being on the brink of something. They're, everybody's on edge about things. There's, there's, there's hopelessness, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's um, the, the, the drug epidemic, the flood of, of uh, the migration directly into fully open borders. I mean, all the things, things fundamentally changing our nation. And then one of our most important resources, the, our fuel supply, our, our strategic, what is it called? Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Reserves are being, have been, but then they just came right out and told us, you know, it had already been uh, becoming depleted because Congress was selling it off to pay off some of our debts as a nation. But then it was just announced the 31st by Biden himself that, yep, we're going to go ahead and just start taking out a million barrels a day. And we're, you know, we have never been this low. And not those things that they took out of our reserve weren't even for us. They were for other nations that did not need it. And so you kind of go, what's going on? And when you start to look around at what's happening and you're just in the weeds, God is saying, uh, 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 look, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and see who I am and what I am doing. Because without the God lens, without the kingdom perspective, you will not be able to apply truth to the facts. See, there, there are facts. There are things that are happening. There are what we would call realities. But then there's the truth of the reality. What is God doing? It looks crazy. It looks amazing. There may, be, there may have been a truth in a situation where the Philistine army was there already intimidating before this giant Goliath, you know, was on their side and now taunting and challenging the the Israelites. And, and it was just like, okay, well, we're now, we're headed toward defeat, and what do we do? And, and they're strategizing, and they're just totally in the weeds. And then, as you know the story so well, David comes along, and he had been spending time in the kingdom with God. His eyes were lifted up. All he saw was his God. All he saw was possibilities. All he saw was that the purposes of God are why I am here. So if that guy, that giant, that army is messing with the purposes of God, coming against God's people, well then, you know what? Find some little rocks and let's do it. Let's just do this thing, you know? Backup will only be for, I don't know, maybe for some other guys that'll come against us. But this is only going to take one shot because I know who my God is. See, that's the kind of perspective that Isaiah 40 really helps to give us. Because God, now he goes on, and I love even from this point all the way through the end of Isaiah, he gives us so many things about himself. Your warfare is ended. Declaration, even if the battle is raging, is still a victory if God says it's a victory. Why? Because 1 John 4, I believe it is verse, I love to give you these, 4, 4. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we are already victorious. We were saved. Um, 1 John 5, 4 is he that is born of God. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, okay, he that is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You don't just get to coast into victory. You get to choose to walk with your Savior into victory. There are people that are choosing to stay in the weeds of fear, depression, anxiety, nervousness. And I'll tell you what, I've said this so many times, that the enemy's after your faith. But you know, a close, close, close cousin to the faith. See, once, once he can get your faith, once he can rob you of your faith, of your belief, of your stance of, of yes, I'm going to choose to stand with my God. If he can cause that to be a little shaky, then right on the heels of that, he can steal your hope. And if there's one thing that is rampant and rising is hopelessness. 
You see it everywhere. Some people, it's hopelessness to suicide. Other people, it's hopelessness to just an existence of doesn't matter what I do, why I'm here, I don't even know. I have no more drive for anything. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go anywhere. There just is no hope. What is the point? Others, they're hopeless to a cynicism. They're hopeless to a place of, well, I'll just, I'll just do my thing so that my existence can just be distracted by good works and some of the things. And, and they're, they're continually grasping at, at what was before. And that's why I loved the word that um, the Lord gave through Wendy Tuesday night, you know, to take a stand. See, when you, when you lose your hopelessness or you, your faith wavers and then, then you're, you have no more hope, you kind of begin to, um, to just, you, you don't engage. You don't, you, you begin to kind of enable or justify some of these things that, that should be taken a stand against. And, and that's where you, you get this place of impotence, really, uh, uh, in, the, in the bride. And it's so, so sad. And this morning, um, it was so awesome. And I, I love how the Holy Spirit uses the first hour when we're together as a church in our groups. But Bryn um, gave the lesson and was talking about the beginning about ending well and the different examples in scripture of, of the men and women of God who some did not end well, had a strong walk with God, but they didn't end well. And then some that did. And what does it take to do that? And one of the things that is so key, if not the thing, is to fiercely protect God's will for your life and plan for your life, the perfect, not the permissible, not to just live in what, what a place you can exist in where you're not under direct condemnation. It's like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to live so I can avoid the hammer of, of God on the throne. First of all, that's a, that paradigm is the greatest indicator that you don't know intimacy with Jesus. Because the closer you are with Jesus, the more you are so drawn in to his presence and his love that you just want to do whatever he says. He does, as Bryn had shared with the, with the, the women, he does just offer. He doesn't manipulate or coerce in us in relationship. He, he, his dominance is not one of his traits. He gives us free will to choose him. But there is something about the love of Jesus that constrains us to him that is so powerful. It's not a manipulation. It's just such a power force that we're just drawn to it because we were literally created to be drawn to it. And so his love just draws us in and that alone makes you just want to give up everything to do it his way. I grew up in a very, um, what I would call, legalistic environment. I use that term a lot. Some people are offended by that term. Um, but it is a, it's an emphasis on outward conformity and, uh, you know, obedience. And, and there is some merit, certainly, in our, our obedience. But it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a teaching, at least that I received, that was from a place of... Um, that, that it comes out of a relationship, that it's like, no, seek first him, and then he's going to transform you to where all, all that comes out is obedience, all that comes out is surrender. It was really a cart before horse kind of teaching, and, and as you know, if you ever put a cart in front of a horse, you're just going to get a mess. Horses aren't designed to push things with their nose. They're designed to pull. And so it was very backward and, and messed up. And, um, but I, when I learned relationship... I noticed that the things that I thought in obedience, I, I, I will openly admit that I just kind of had a, um, I don't know, a resistance. Well, let's just call it what it is, rebellion. <laughs> I had a rebellion to just some of these, I just saw different people that just were like, yeah, you're just kind of told what to do and you're just doing it. And there was something within me that was like, I'm not against that, but I got to have a little more. I, you got it. Like, why? Like, like, what's what's my reason? You know, it wasn't like I had to understand the result of the obedience. I just needed I needed it to be within. I need I, I didn't understand that what God was doing in me a long time ago. Praise God, and I don't want to start weeping over it, but He was He built me in a way that needed to have a passion for authentic obedience and a real reason, not just 
you know, go along and just tell me what to do. And okay, I will do this. You know, it, it just, I just wasn't. In fact, I just thought I would blow things up to just not have any of that. It, it, you know, and so naturally then the parents didn't want their kids hanging out with me because, you know, I, I'm not, because it wasn't like I was doing a whole lot of crazy bad things. It was just kind of a, I don't want you, I don't want you, you know, spending a lot of time with, with Lexi because, you know, I don't know why. I just don't want you spending a lot of time with her, you know. <laughs> there was just these things that they would, that, that, that would come against me because I just did not go with the grain. And, um, and I went into a college that was even more strict than my upbringing, and that was crazy. I, my joke about my college was that you couldn't be naked in the shower. <laughs> it was just like, it was so strict. But it was, it was a search for something real and something authentic. And when you enter into the real, and it's really, you allow it in, and you're, you're just willing to just, Lord, I, I just want you. There is something that he will do in your life that will show you that I don't want anything to do with the world. I don't want, I don't want what's allowed. I just want, if you created me, then why do I want to go off course and dabble in something that you didn't create me for? It's like when you have a relationship with your creator, you want to know why you, what you were made for. I want to operate in everything he designed me to be. That's the only way I'll have confidence. That's the only way that keeps the passion alive. It's like this amazing, and he's continuing to unfold things that he's doing in me. That is the same with each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. That is the absolute place you're going to find confidence in who you are. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to show you a couple of these verses. So, her warfare has ended, um, the latter part of verse 2, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then in verse 3, a very familiar uh, verses that have, were stated out of the Gospels, referring in the John the Baptist ministry, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I had to laugh when they sang the song this morning with that, and we sing it also in the newer Elevation songs, but... Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low. Uneven ground shall become level and rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Now, what does it mean to prepare the way of the Lord? When you are prepared, that's what we're doing right now. We are through testing, trial, and training we are preparing the way, we are emptying ourselves, we are making room for the Lord, for his glory to be seen through us. Preparing the way is releasing the entanglements of this life so that all the rough places can be made smooth, the mountains can be leveled, everything is, is prepared for God to just come in through the power of the Holy Spirit and us to operate um, literally empowered by Jesus. He gave me a brief vision during worship that was just so cool where, you know, I'm, I'm just asking him, please just, just speak forth your heart through me this morning. And, and so I saw myself up here, and then I saw Jesus standing right here, and I was just like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're going to be right beside me. But then all of a sudden, Jesus was standing there, and then he came over and superimposed himself upon me. And so that I, as I continued to move and to speak, it wasn't me, it was him. And he showed me this place of, this is what I want. This is what I want. I want you to be a walking Jesus, a vessel that is so prepared in the way of the Lord that my glory, the glory of the Father will be seen through your life. That is, that's what this is all about. That's what all these hard times, these testing times, these waiting, nothing is wasted. If there's ever a day where you just feel like, you know, what's going on? There's not much happening. And every moment is with intention. When you rise, you may not have a lot on your calendar. You may not have a lot on your schedule. Maybe you're just feeling like there's some sort of monotony or something mundane. No, no, no. God is doing something unique and special. And every, every yes you give him to stay the course is great victory. It is victory. It is not defeat. And he is using it for your good and for his glory. It's so awesome. 
Then in verse 6, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of a field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the frailty of man. Psalm 103 talks about us being but dust. We are as dust. God's power, God, God wants to take us and, and flow through us, but we never, ever, self-importance and thinking that, that we have all, all that or that, that we have something that's, um, that's worthy apart from God making us worthy is just an illusion. God is great. Verse 9, get you up to a mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Man, Greg's been preaching a lot about that. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Oh, and his recompense, his recompense before him. Compensation, reversal, restoration of all that's been stolen, all that's wrong. What God had, his recompense is coming. These are verses, by the way, that, yes, have been established in the spirit, but it's effectiveness and impact on us comes through our declaration, our faith and our, rele- our belief of it, I mean, and our speaking of it. Like Paul said, I believed, therefore I have spoken. When Romans 8 talks about um, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I, I've said this many times, I'm going to say it again. It's not, that verse is not saying that if God is for us, no one is against us. Of course there are people against us. It's talking about what does it matter who's against us? It's talking about impact, that those against us will not have impact when God is for us. Because why? Because our, our eyes are lifted above the weeds. If you're just down in the weeds, you're so bogged down. You're literally, imagine for a moment being the size of an ant and seeing these huge stalks of things around you in, in a grass patch or a bunch of weeds. They're monumental, and that is all you can see. They become so huge. But when you are lifted up, when you are taken from the carnal to the kingdom, in your, in your faith, which you can choose by faith to have because it's offered to us, right? You suddenly see the landscape is completely different. So even though there are factual things happening right now in this world, we know that this nation is being detoxed. If you are only looking at, and, and I don't, I realize when it comes to staying up to date on world events, news, things like that. People have to be cautious and careful that they are receiving it through the God lens. Um, There are some people that say, oh, I I never ever watch the news because I just can't handle it. It just, you know. Be careful to both be not ignorant of Satan's devices, but also to receive the measure of it that you're supposed to receive through a God lens. You don't want to just feed on all of the evil and because you will find it will catch up to you. And it can, it can sometimes kind of sucker punch your, you know, you in the right spot to where you're like, oh, man, that one really took my breath away. I, and I got to tell you, it didn't take my breath away. It angered me, actually. But it, it, was, it was pretty astounding to hear about these oil reserves, the strategic oil reserve being depleted to this degree. I mean, we are so, humanly speaking, we are more ripe for a takeover than ever, ever before. And the enemy wants it so bad, but guess what? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And even though there is wickedness in places of power, which is a complete sham and will be destroyed, praise God, the reason the United States has been a superpower is because we have chosen and started this nation serving the superpower. That is really the truth of it. And so... 
God is not going to let that be destroyed. And, and he's heard the cries of his people. But he declared in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it's if my people, God's people, okay, will humble themselves, seek his face and pray, okay, then he hears from heaven. And we have done that and continue to do that. But now he's saying, stand, but find my comfort. Find my comfort that as you shake, you know, it's funny when you think of shaking, you can either see shaking as a really, really unstable place that just, oh my goodness, this this is, I'm feeling sick, I'm feeling, I'm feeling wobbly, I'm feeling like I'm going to fall down. Or you can, like a baby being shaken, or you know how babies, you know, you hold them and you kind of, you hold them and you bounce them. Some babies like to be bounced, some others don't, and you got to kind of know the baby. But when they're being shaken, you know, babies, that's calming to them. That's comforting to them. They're just like, yeah, that's cool. Move away. In fact, I I was even talking to Yvonne about roller coasters and stuff. And she was, you know, talking about the difference between some parks and other parks. And she was talking about one. And she said, yeah, and I just don't know if I like that one. Because that, I mean, I don't know. The roller coasters there just aren't as thrilling, you know, as over here. And, of course, my perspective is just totally different. Like, I'm just thinking, did you say thrilling or (laughs) throw-upping? You know, like, you know, that's not, I'm not drawn to that. I I don't know that I ever was. But God is saying, you know, you've got to get his lens or you're going to see what can be comforting as pretty unsettling. But he's saying, no, this shaking, I want to comfort you. The warfare has ended. Do you know that you're already a victor in Christ Jesus? You get to choose every day to believe that. Do you know that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood? You are the the prize of God in faith when you choose him. It's something that we have to really receive what we've already been given and then operate our lives with that. And that's what I loved about this chapter He will carry them, the latter part of verse 11, I love this. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Um, The gently lead those, I I love that. From Matthew 11, 28, 29, we know that. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But guess what? The rest is available when you come unto me. If you are running from me, you will not have rest, okay? So let's just turn that verse inside out a minute. If you run from me, the rest is here. You are somewhere over there. We have to come to him and then give him our burdens in exchange for his rest. What he offers does have to be received. It does. It isn't given to us to where we robotically, nothing is required of us. And uh, as many people have pointed out, but Bryn just happened to this this morning as well, he called us into an authentic relationship of love by choice. Because it's not real love if we are forced to love him. And you know that in a marriage. I'm greatly loved by Greg because he could have chosen anyone else. And he chose me. And I chose him. And he feels loved by me. And If he were the only man on planet Earth, and I was his, okay, fine, whatever, I'll take her. You know, like, yeah, no, I don't feel really, that's not what is the makings of a good relationship. You know, he just had to do it. That's not what we want. And the Lord is so good. I'm going to skip down to verse 13. This is another thing that's so important to remember about God and his power. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Does God seriously get advice from somebody to do what he does? It's like he is God. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him the knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Oh, man, he gets counsel from no one. Verse 15, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. They are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. And I don't even have to go into what Greg did last week. Creation itself will be seen, and there will be a demonstration of God's power in creation itself. And it's going to be quite a sight to see, even though it will be part of the shaking. And the ominous part is not 
again, it's for God's enemies. It's not for God's people. We are to hold on, even though we will, we will be um, impacted to some degree from that happening. Um, let's look at verse 18. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol. A craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it uh, for silver chains. He, he who is too impoverished or too poor for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Oh, man. Now, I, there's another portion of Isaiah that goes into the absurdity and the ignorance of making something with your own hand, okay, like, I made it, I carved it, now I'm going to bow to it and ask it to help me in times of trouble. Okay. Cuckoo. I mean, really? That's the craziness of not understanding by faith who God is. And, but it asks the question, now it asks it in 18 and it asks it in 25. Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One which is the lead up to verse 26, lift up your eyes. Don't see God through your own experiences of what you think God is. You know, this is where God, God never was in a box, doesn't get in a box. But because of sometimes our limitations or our fears or our brokenness or our unwillingness to see and to lift up our eyes and to really look to him, lifting up your eyes is all about faith. It's all about choosing to just believe. That's what lifting it, that, when, you can, when you can lift out of this realm and go, okay, I'm going to look, I'm going to spend time here. He's going to show you a whole, different, a whole different life without one single circumstance changing, by the way, which is the amazing point. But when you look at God and who he is and, and how you can relate to him through your own experiences, it's, uh, it's very limiting. Now, the enemy knows this. And that's why he uses horrific, abusive, false religions in people's lives from their childhood. He uses um, oppressive atmospheres in homes um, of, of harsh, abusive discipline while they're quoting Bible verses. So you get, they, they get this torment, this abuse feeling from God. Their fathers maybe did terrible things to them. And so to hear the, to hear the words, God, my father, they equate it to how their, their um, human father treated them. And, and Satan has many, many strategies of how he wants you to not be in, um, in a, in a place of truth with who he really is. But be careful not to liken God to something that you have made up or that you've experienced. Make sure you're always looking to him for more of who he is. And sometimes to actually see more of God, you have to be willing to set aside more of you. That's really that place of faith. That's where it gets into 26. Lift up your eyes and see. He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Now this is where, verse 27 and 28, um, and the Lord has said this through the prophets. He is talking and talking and talking. He's telling us so much right now because it's time for him to move and he's giving us the opportunity to believe him before his movement. It is a gift that there is so much being given to the prophets. Um, and of course, you need to be a Berean when it comes to the prophets. You need to know who is the Lord speaking with and who is just jumping on the bandwagon to speak a lot of things that are not the Lord's voice. This is nothing new. False prophets today are nothing new. As soon as Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, there were people that were jumping on that power bandwagon, wanting to buy the power of the Holy Spirit that the disciples had to rebuke, that were wanting to mimic because they got to see the movement behind what God was doing through his prophets. Satan's always, always trying to copycat, counterfeit, anything he can do to mess with people and thwart the plan of God in our lives and in this world. But God is saying a lot. And one of the things he's saying is, are you kidding me? You think I cannot see everything? <laughs> That's my version of these verses. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Verse 27. My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Really? You, you think that your way is hidden? You think that what you do in secret? There has never been more light shining 
on people. People are coming out, if you will, that don't even want to be out. I mean, God is saying, no, I am going to tear back the curtain and expose your nakedness and your evil. The Methodist church, um, one of the Methodist churches, I don't even know the area, some of you heard it, just a, another major scandal in pulpits uh, that should be for, for Almighty God, a drag queen pastor. Now, the Lord said this was coming, but I mean, really, you know, the things that are happening, the, um, what really amounts to just total satanic debauchery has been happening right in sanctuaries of supposedly God's churches which are not God's. And he's saying, this was in the hearts. I'm allowing it to bubble up and manifest into overt behavior, but now I'm going to expose it all to the world, and I'm going to send my fire to burn it straight up. And you're going to see people dropping dead. You're going to see people stepping down. They're stepping down all the time. You're going to see the holiness of God, the Ananias and Sapphira, why? You could have chosen. You could have chosen to do what was right, but you denied and then defied the most holy God. And um, those things result, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, you know, they result in death and destruction. When you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption and, and death. And this is the woe that we're in. We're going to see it a whole lot more. But 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. I do have to point this out to you. Okay. These are two places that are really important. I do have to go back to verse 22. Or actually 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? He who sits above the circle of the earth. The earth is round. Can I just say that? Okay. Flat earth, people. The earth is round. And that's not the only part, portion in Scripture. You can, you can see that with your own eyes. There's just too much evidence now. But I just, I don't know. That was a sticking point with me. Those are things that, man, okay, not going to rabbit trail. I'm going to use restraint. All right. But, it, but so we'll go back to creator of the ends of the earth. The reason I was saying that is because some people have also used verses like ends of the earth to mean that there is an end of the earth where you can fall off. And no, that is not the case. In the very same chapter. He does not grow faint or grow, does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. It is, it is a constant, it's a treasure trove of just amazing depth and wisdom. These verses are the most popular, the most famous, but I, I just want to point something out because it just struck me. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. The Lord is always trying to remind us that just because there are ways that life is in this realm does not mean it is the way it's supposed to be. It is truly, it is true that everything right now is upside down. It is backwards. There, isn't, there was an intention of God that before sin came that we have not seen because we have been under the curse of sin since Adam, right? Adam and Eve. But the youths, okay, that we understand will even grow weary. The Lord never grows weary. And there's one thing that's so important, so important for us to, to believe by faith no matter what we experience is that Jules, Mia, Lucas, Marley, and I was going to name the other kids that were here today, you are not too young to do mighty, great things for God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and impact the world. And I'm not going to name the other end of the spectrum, but anybody who would be considered over their prime, I don't even like that term, there is a prime of life 
constraint of, of uh, deception in this world that absolutely paralyzes lives. It is, it is uh, surrounded by words like retirement, like um, over the hill, things that are basically just death and useful, uselessness after a certain number. And I just want to tell you, you need to live every day in absolute defiant rejection of these kinds of constraints because they are not of God. There are plenty of examples in Scripture, but it's so important. Retirement ought to only be a, a mindset of that season of what I did, the Lord may not be having me do anymore. It doesn't mean retirement into a death rocking chair on a nice porch with a big house that I earned. You know, you can, you can earn everything you want. God loves to bless his children. But it's not a, the big house and all the things you earned are not a place to die in. They're a place to live every day to the fullest and live with the faith that defies death itself. You know, there is a permeating, very slithery, snaky kind of philosophy um, that is called eugenics. You want to look that up, what eugenics is. Eugenics is essentially a philosophy of what is determined as the most useful age range. Little kids, they're too vulnerable, too volatile. Let's kill them in the womb, you know. And the, and the younger ones, whatever. If we can't indoctrinate them, let's get rid of them too. And then there's the older people. You know, whatever. Let them die. They're old. And then there's the disabled. Not functional, not strong. Can't, can't contribute to, to what I need. So, you know, let them, let them just go ahead and give them something to make them comfortable and, and let them die off in some facility somewhere. It is evil that only the, what they determine to be youthful and strong is the, is the viable, valued human. That is not the way of God. Every single life is precious. It's with intention. And read Psalm 139 to get perspective on that. I love that, love that, love that. And I encourage every one of you to memorize it. It is an amazing chapter, and it will encourage you. But this kind of evil, the Lord is saying here, even the youths will grow faint. Don't ever think. He can give you the strength just like he did Elijah, Moses, you know, you can have strength at any age. You can have wisdom, experiential wisdom at any young age if God, when God gives it to you. And you can have vitality, strength, and a youthful energy at any older age when God gives it to you. It's not like it has to be one or the other. Okay, well, you got the, you got the youth and vitality, but, you know, you got the stupidity when you're younger. But then you got, the, you got the wisdom, but now you can't even move. So your wisdom is just kind of stuck in a box in a rocking chair on your porch, you know. Hopefully somebody, somebody will come and extract it from me because I can't move. Don't live in those kinds of confines. Sometimes when we experiencing these, these, experience these pains in our bodies and these limitations, God still honors our faith. It doesn't mean be in denial. It doesn't mean, nope, doesn't, not real, not real, not real. No, it means, Lord, you are bigger than this, and I'm going to believe you for my healing, and I'm going to follow you, I'm going to rest, I'm going to steward my body the way that you tell me to steward it, but I'm going to believe you for whatever you tell me to do. All I care about is what you tell me to do. I'm not going to listen for what you might be saying based on how I feel today. If I feel strong, hmm, you must be telling me to do something that's going to me a lot of energy because I feel actually good today. No, no, no. Don't get cart before horse. Lord, what would you have me do? If the Lord wants you to do something absurd, trust him. He will give you what you need to do that. But his voice and the obedience to his voice comes first. And I won't repeat my many, many times testimonies of Nigeria, but he surely took me there before I felt equipped at all. You guys know the catchphrase. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Why? Because it has to be for his glory. It has to be for his glory. There is a, um, a verse that probably I repeat more than any other verse because I, 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 it's just my mantra. It's just literally the mantra of my life, and that is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, right? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. There is something interesting about this verse, though, that if you don't acknowledge him in all your ways and you don't trust him 
And you need to understand, and we said this a little bit at the gifts meeting, if, if you are in an Eve, I just need to know. I just, I have to know what I don't know in order to step. And, and that's within all of us. I mean, all of us certainly feel better with the plan explained, right? But there are things that when God doesn't reveal them, he still expects us to, to be obedient without the knowledge up here. Because if we only always or ever just obey when we feel like we've got it figured out up here, then where is our faith? Our faith is in our understanding. The thing that I notice gets touted a lot, and, and I don't want to judge a heart. Perhaps people are actually thinking and thinking Jesus in their heart. But you know sometimes people will say, they'll go through a harrowing experience and maybe they'll be interviewed or they'll be asked about it and well, what, what got you through it? Oh, it was my faith. You know, yeah, my faith. My faith was really, you know, if it wasn't for my faith, you know, it would really. And I, I often go, okay, so your faith, your, you mean just, just having faith? Or what was your faith in that got you through? Because there are people that have faith in faith. And that, you're going to, it's going to be a futile to, to have just faith in the fact that you have faith. Well, I just, I just kind of just believe. I'm just, you know, that, that's altruism. I, I just want to, I just believe everything's just going to work out. It's going to be great. I just have faith in that. And that's, you know, that's just what gets me through is my faith. That's not faith in Jesus. See, Jesus wants to be glorified. So when, and the Father, and, and Jesus operated to bring glory to the Father. And so what gets us through, we need to acknowledge him in all our ways, not acknowledge our ability through our decision of understanding that all things will probably work out good because I'm a glass is half empty gal, not a glass is half full, you know, or a glass is half full, not a glass is half empty gal. So therefore, the Pollyanna side of me is kind of what I trust in. And you just go so awry. That is not what's going to make it through. That is part of what we're being shaken out of. It's like, man, that sounds like religion, faith in Jesus, but it's not. And the hard times are going to be what proves that out. Jesus has got to be our rock. We can't have faith in faith. It's a dangerous place to be. And that's why I love that. Trust in the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible with all of your heart. And then in every single thing you do, acknowledge him. Give him the glory. When I, when I wake up and I'm breathing, I acknowledge that my ability to breathe is because he is in me. He, he gave me life. The, the comfort of a soft pillow, he put there. Blankets. I mean, all you have to do is just travel a bit where some of these things do not exist. And you begin to have comforts, I, I, thankfulness and gratefulness for for things that maybe you wouldn't call a comfort, but I call them comforts. You know, when you have Q-tips, I just, so I'm thankful. I just, sometimes I just look around and I just go, God, you provided all of this. You know, when you're in the weeds, you can have stacked stocks of food and all these supplies that, you, you know, lest there be shortages. And you still look around and you don't feel like you have anything because your perspective isn't kingdom, it's carnal. And carnal, by the way, you know, the lust of the flesh is never satisfied or gratified. It is, that's the very nature of lust. It is an unquenchable thirst that's never fulfilled. Whereas God fulfills us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. He is our rock. And we know from, and I don't have to spend much time on this because Greg even preached it last week, but... Mounting up with wings as eagles really is lifting up your eyes, um, even though the Lord had laid that title on me far before last week. But, but I love that don't see, in verse 30, I want to finish and drive that thought home one more time. Don't see youth, strength, energy, um, uh, privilege in um, maybe status or money, don't see those things as reasons why they will do more for God or be blessed and you won't. Don't look at it that way. Literally, go to the Lord and ask him to speak over you and, fi and, and find out who he says you are. And you will be amazed. First of all, 
you want to see more miracles? You know how we're waiting for miracles? Yes, we're waiting for miracles in this nation. We're waiting for the, the sham lie of the guy in the White House that's calling himself our leader. We want him, you know, knocked down and out and all these things. But you will see miracle after miracle after miracle in your own life when you begin to see what God will do when you just say yes. I, I am amazed that when... I get knocked by the enemy with an infirmity, something that just suddenly will not work anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a Greg story and not mine. He woke up one, one morning, and I believe he shared this. His wrist was in just horrific pain. It was like, what did I do to my wrist? I don't know. Was I, you know, literally fighting, you know, in, the, in my sleep? And I didn't have any recollection of that, and he certainly didn't, you know, move a lot one night where he'd hurt his wrist. He just got just hit with this spirit of infirmity on his wrist. And it has been a challenge. It has been, you just, you wouldn't even think that that seemingly little thing could have tentacles to to mess with so many things. Even even between us, when, when we're moving in and we're moving stuff and we're loading and we're, we've always been a team, you know, we've always, we pick stuff up, you know, if he's got one end, the Lord's given me strength, and I just pick up the other end of the couch, or the table, or the chairs, or all of it at the same time, and I'm like, I'm lifting my side, I'm like, come on, grab it, and he's like, hey, man, I can't, my wrist, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, stop crying, baby, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm not, it's like not registering with me that it's really a problem, but, but it's real. It's really been an issue. He's, you know, he's, he's worked through it. He got a, a, a special glove that he took with him even to, you know, Iraq and, and where he's going to go there. But it's just been strange. When you experience things like that, now he has not let that slow him down. He has had it not allow him to lift certain things. And uh, in working on things, I know he, he, he's actually put more weight on the other arm and things like that. But when you have those things hit you, it it does a number on you. You kind of go, whoa, okay. Uh, you know, the first thing that the enemy does is he strikes you with something, and then his little minion demons are there to tell you what this means. Now you can't do this. Oh, see, you're older now. Oh, you've got to change this. You've got to, oh, and you've got to start, you know, readjusting your life now. You've got to start slowing down. This is a little... And, and you kind of have to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Lift up my eyes. Lift up my eyes. Lord, what is this? What's going on here? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I won't be in denial because I want to steward my body. Tell me how to deal with this. But I will not listen to the enemy who says that because I am hit with this, that I'm now not on the path that you originally put me on. See, we need to be fiercely protecting the will of God for our lives. Not allowing a derailment, a way that we get knocked about to and fro in the storms of life to then have us consider that maybe this is the plan. Or you know what? I'm, I was on the path, but I got knocked so hard. Oh, man, I did not expect that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand over here in the permissible place of God because, you know, I mean, he still loves me in his grace and mercy. I'm just going to stay over in the permissible. Did God not promise you he would give you whatever you need? to do what he's called you to do, these are the times we will lose out big time, as was shared in the ladies' class, if we are not willing to protect the absolute um, will of God for our lives, the perfect that he has. Don't consider even anything you're actually experiencing. Lord, how can I go to Nigeria without a dime in my pocket? How? Well, just ask Derek. If God wants you to go, he will give you strength in your body. Now, he might not even give you strength in your body until you're already walking several steps on your way. You're not going to necessarily feel whole and strong and wake up transformed and three inches taller and 50 pounds thinner you're, before you even get your passport. No, he says, go, step. He didn't ask, you know, he didn't give Peter a training course on how to walk on the water. He just said, come out, come out, step out, step out. And I know exactly, I can only imagine how Peter felt. This is so cool. It's so awesome to be walking. Weeds, weeds, <laughs> weeds, water. This isn't normal. This isn't natural. This isn't the ways of man. People don't walk on water, Jesus. Don't you know these things? 
And yet Jesus is saying, yeah, but I live in a different plane. I live in a different plane. While you're in the midst of the ways of this earth, you're also in my kingdom. You're a citizen of heaven. So will you think and will you walk in that place even while living in the other place? That's faith. Faith, this time when we are in both places, but we don't have to be impacted by one place, that's that place of faith. Pretty soon, this earth will pass away and no, faith will no longer be needed. When Jesus comes, when the perfect comes, faith will no longer be needed. But right now, we get to experience Jesus. We get to experience the eye hath not seen nor the ear hath heard. Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. By faith, we experience it now. That's not a holding on to for heaven statement. That those are things right now. Um, I'm going to end with these verses here because I thought they were just so important. Paul is um, talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it's a perspective that Paul had to have right at the beginning, because when God called him on the road to Damascus, and then he went into training, he, if, you, if you read the beginning of Paul's story, Saul turning to Paul, his story, he was immediately told how many things he must suffer. That's not often the way our, our plan turns out. I'm, I was sharing this morning in the ladies' class, even myself, that I, I'm thankful for what the Lord has not told me I would go through, um, that I was just in that moment clinging to him and that I didn't, he didn't lay out the whole plan that might have felt better to me, but guess what? It would have given me a whole lot more time to strategize in fear and worry. When it just happens, it just happens. <laughs> it's like the, sometimes my, um, my chiropractor, if he's ever going to adjust my neck, he knows where I'm very uncomfortable with that. So he'll, he'll just, you know, gently kind of move and just you know, move a few pieces, almost like he's going to maybe just press instead of twist. And then as soon, right before he's going to twist, he'll, he'll take my thought to a different place. He'll ask me a question about something or he'll say, you know, is your foot hurt or move your toe? And as soon as he does that, boom, my, <laughs> my whole, I've, I'm, I've turned around. It's, it's not that bad, not exorcism, but, um, but I'm like, oh, and, and every time it, it works every time. If he were to say, okay, now on the count of three, I'm going to jerk your neck so far, you're going to hear a huge crunch, and you'll probably feel nauseous, okay? So let's get ready. No. He doesn't want me to think about it. It's like, no, relax, and boom, and then do it. That's what the Lord wants. It'll, it'll be great. Just trust me. Just trust me. You know, you'll feel a little bit of a, and then, it, and then it's over, and you'll be further along because you'll be adjusted, if you will. But this... Um, in 2 Corinthians um, 4, he, he talks about the, you know, the light of the gospel and having this ministry um, by the mercy of God. He's like, we're not going to lose heart. We've renounced the disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning and tamper with God's word. I'm going to skip down, though, to verse 7. But we have this treasure, okay, our, the treasure of what God created in our bodies, in jars of clay, Okay, they're a little bit fragile. To show for the purpose of showing the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. And these things are very important as in the times that we're living in now. We are afflicted in every way. But, and I, man, I, in, in each one of these, um, I circled the word but. That is a very, very important but. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body, okay, in this realm, we're carrying the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. As I'm recognizing my weakness I am able to see the life and power and glory of God flow through me. If I constantly and always felt able-bodied, energetic, strong with no weaknesses, what would I trust in? Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't give those things. He does give those things. But I'm telling you, he trains us each individually differently. There are people he will give physical strength for, but he will test them in a different way. Others, he'll test all with physical strength. Some it'll be with, with mental torment. Some get it all based on what they have to learn in training. 
But these things, these limitations of our circumstances, our, 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 the, the ways of, of life in this realm are supposed to be challenging so that we get to see the life of Jesus manifested in us. That's what, that's what he wants to comfort us with today. That's why he said, your warfare has ended. If you'll just believe this one thing, yes, there are, there's a, a little bit more time of some very, very intense times. There are some suddenlies that are going to whack-a-mole us. But we will be able to bounce right back up. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. I'm going back in time a bit, but do you guys remember that commercial? We might be weebles that wobble, but we are not going to fall. We may actually go all the way down, but we're going to pop right back up in the manifest power of Jesus. That is so, so important. And that is the greatest comfort we could possibly receive. And so I just want to remind you of that. And when I was asking the Lord that, all I can tell you is that he said, they're going to need this word this morning. So for whatever reason, hold fast to the word of the Lord to be applied with whatever it is that you or us as a group or the nation or whatever is going through. Don't let that turn into an evil foreboding of the enemy. Just know that God, no matter what, I walk in your comfort. I walk in your peace, your joy. And man, I love the way Jeff put it last night on the prayer call. He said, man, it, it's like it's not, but it almost feels wrong that I have so much peace. And, and, and like nobody around, everybody around me is just on the verge of just, just craziness. There's chaos, there's tension, there's nervousness. And he, the, the peace, it's like, man, I, you know, I, I want to spread this around a little bit. I, I'm just, I've got so much compared to others. It's available to everyone. It's the Lord has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. If there's a buffet around you and, and it's available and here's the plates, you just get a plate and you get yourself some food, but then you decide to start running circles around the rest of the room. Okay, um, the food's right here. And, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. You know, you just kind of go, okay, what? You know, like, it's right here. It's your choice. You can choose to partake and be filled and be satisfied. Or you can be like a chicken running around saying the sky is falling all the time. It is your choice. That carnal or kingdom, lift up your eyes. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for who you are. God, I just praise you. God, I thank you for the power even of worship. God, when we just acknowledge you in all of our ways, God, you, you literally, you inhabit your praises. You respond. No wonder you direct our path because then you, you respond and you're with us. You illuminate truth and wisdom and revelation. And, and all of a sudden, we can just see what we couldn't see before. Thank you, God, that the worship that you deserve with no reward for us is what you deserve. But yet you reward us by actually inhabiting the very praises we give to you. God, I just thank you. I thank you, God, what you give us in worship and what that worship does to the enemy in showing him that we will not be intimidated by him. And as we worship you and acknowledge you in that confident place of unintimidation, not having the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, it reminds him daily of his demise, which is coming. And I just thank you. It's, it's already done. God, help us to just lift up our eyes to who you are. I, I have, you know, Lord, I could go on and on that, that as I trusted you for more and as I believed you for more, you literally invaded the very atmosphere where I was. And, and it, I just, you take us different places, glorious, glorious places in your presence and we don't seek the high, God, but we seek the most high in you. And whatever you give, God, we are not worthy, but you, you, because of the blood of Jesus, you make us worthy. 
And I just praise you, God. I just want to just praise you. I love you, and I thank you. Thank you for Isaiah 40. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul, his perspective that all the things he went through were a but God. Whatever we go through, you are our deliverer, our help, our hope, our redeemer, our restorer, our life. You vindicate, you defend. God, you are our champion enthroned. So I just give you praise today. And I pray that anyone who does not know this relationship with you, that they would come before you and repent of their sins, ask you for forgiveness, which you give immediately from 1 John 1, 9, and then receive you into their life. God, anyone listening or who will ever listen to the podcast or the online message, God, that they would receive you, that they would know your love. God, just show up. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to rest upon this word for every time it is ever listened to, that people would receive you with this gift that you offer. Lord, I just, we just love you. We just want your will, and we believe you. We receive the comfort of this truth this morning. And I just declare all of this in the mighty, holy, awesome name of Jesus. Amen.